In this lecture, we'll be introducing the concept of factor variables, and we'll be looking at uh, some statistical models um, that use factors as covariates and how to do uh, hypothesis testing with f-tests. Okay, so a factor is a qualitative or categorical variable that can take on one of several levels, uh, which are the categories that it can take on. So let's just look at some examples, and this will be clear what this means. So in this example, the factor is dog breed, and the levels are greyhound, saluki, or whippet, which are three dog breeds. So the factor is the name of the variable, and the levels are the values or categories that the factor can take on. So another example would be religion. So you have subjects, and you list out their religions. Uh, they could have levels Christian, Jewish, Muslim, so on and so forth. Another example, um, we'll be looking at um, this in, in detail throughout the rest of the lecture. The factor is treatment. So say you're doing a drug trial and you want to test the efficacy, efficacy of several different drugs. Um, you might have a, you put subjects into a control group, a group that gets drug A, a group that gets drug B, and a group that gets drug C if you're testing three different drugs. So the factor is the treatment that the patient receives, and the levels are control drug A, drug B, or drug C. Now the important thing to remember about factors is that for each factor variable, its levels are mutually exclusive and exhaustive within the data set. So what that means is that for every row of the data set or every subject in the data set, they have one and exactly one level of the factor. Um, so you can imagine that, uh, you know, for this drug trial, for example, you might have a group that received both drug A and drug B. And so to deal with that, you would just create an additional level of the factor, which was drug A and drug B. Um, so we we'll always think of the levels of the factor as mutually exclusive and exhaustive within the data set. And I say within the data set. Um, so for example, if you had a data set that only had Christian, Jewish, and uh, Muslim subjects, then you would just list those as the three levels of the factor, even though there are you know, more re religions in the world. Okay, so the example we're going to keep in mind for this lecture is uh, an experiment or drug trial on uh, blood pressure medication. So the question is, what is the effect of two different drugs on systolic blood pressure? And here's how we design the experiment. We recruit 12 subjects. Subjects 1 through 4 get a placebo, um, so that will serve as the control group. Subjects 5 through 8 get drug A. So the next four subjects get drug A, and subjects 9 through 12 get drug B. So the last four get uh, drug B. And then the levels, so the factor is going to be the treatment group, and then the levels are placebo, drug A, or drug B. And then um, at the end of the study, we're going to measure the change in systolic blood pressure after one month. Now we need some notation for this experiment. So I'm going to, as before, I'm going to use uh, Y for the response. And I'm going to discuss two different types of notations that are um, common for uh, the responses. So the first is going to seem familiar because this is going to be similar to what we did in simple linear regression and uh, multiple linear regression. We're going to label the response lowercase y with subscript I. So what this means is this is the change in blood pressure for the ith subject in the study. And then of course we're going to have to associate each subject with uh, a level of the factor and for that we're going to use uh, this indexing notation. So J of I is the level of the factor for the ith subject. So let's just see how this works for this particular data set. So in the first row, I'm just listing out the notation for the responses for all 12 subjects. That's just Y1 up to Y12. And then J of I is going to be the level of the factor 
um, for each of these 12 subjects. So the, remember the first four got the uh, placebo, which is level one. So those are one, 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 one. The second four get drug A, which we labeled as level two. So this is two, 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 two. And then the last four get drug B, which is level three. Okay, now we have the notation we need to specify the model. And it's pretty simple, here's all it is. So capital YI is the random variable we're using to model the data response, uh, lowercase yi. And this is equal to b0 plus b sub j of i plus epsilon i. And our assumption about the errors is that they're independent normal. So that's the same as before. So if this looks confusing, uh, one strategy for trying to make sure you understand uh, what the model specification means is let's just pick a few values for i for this data set and then write out what the model equation is. So let's pick i equals 2. So y2 is going to be b0 plus b sub j of 2. So we have to look up what is j of 2. The second one is a 1. So j of 2 is 1. So this becomes b0 plus b1 plus epsilon 2. All right, let's do number 8. Uh, b0 plus b sub j of 8. And the eighth one is a 2. So we'll get b0 plus b2 plus epsilon 8. And then one more, uh, y sub 11 is going to be b0 plus b sub j of 11, which is 3, plus epsilon 11. So what this model ends up doing is it assigns three different expected values. So it's going to be either b0 plus b1, or b0 plus b2, or b0 plus b3, depending on which level um, that of the factor that the subject belongs to. So this is actually a really simple model. There's three different levels of the factor. Each level gets its own expected value, b0 plus b1, or b0 plus b2, or b0 plus b3, depending on the level of the factor. And then there's an independent normal error at the end. Okay, so that's single subscript notation. We'll probably be using this one most often, uh, but you also see this double subscript notation, um, which is the following. So in this notation, we incorporate the level of the factor into the notation for the response. So here we write y subscript ij, and what that means is this is the change in blood pressure for the ith subject from level j. Okay, so here i has a different meaning. It's not just, we're, we're not just listing out i equals 1 to 11 we're labeling subjects within the level of the factor. So here i is only going to run from 1 to 4, and that's because there's a maximum of 4 subjects per level of the factor. All right, so let's write this out. So we'll pay a little bit more attention to this line. So this is yij. Here are the responses for the 12 subjects. And the first four um, are labeled y11, so this is the first subject that got level 1. The second one is y21, so this is the second subject that got level 1. y31, third subject that got level 1, and y41. And then the fifth observation is y12, which means this is the first subject that got level 2 of the factor. And then so on and so forth, and then we get to the um, ninth subject. This is the first subject that got level 3, and then you have y13, y23, y33, y43. Now this this doesn't change, uh, but I've um, listed it out here just so that you can see the, the similarities between these two. And then the model formulation is uh, in some ways a little bit simpler. Um, capital YIJ is the model for lowercase yij, and this is just b0 plus b sub j plus epsilon ij. And then, so again, to try to understand the notation, let's just pick out some, uh, some of the observations and write down the model for them. Here I'm picking out the same three. So 
I'm picking out the second one, the eighth one, and the eleventh one. The second one is y21. So this is simply b0 plus b1 plus epsilon21. Um, the eighth one is uh, this one, y42, which is simply b0 plus b2, because j is 2, plus epsilon42. And the eleventh one is y33, b0 plus b3 plus epsilon33. Okay, so in both of these models, just to reiterate, each level gets its own expected value. And in terms of our parameters, that expected value is b0 plus bj. So that's the expected value for the jth level of the factor. And these are just two different ways of writing the same exact model. What you'll notice is that um, the right-hand side of, of these three are the same. So b0 plus b1 plus error, b0 plus two, b2 plus error, b0 plus b3 plus error. These are the same as up here. Now there's one more way that we'll um, specify these models. And this is important to understand if you want to know what, what R is doing. Um, and also if you want to understand how do these models fit into the multiple uh, linear regression framework. Now I gave you a, a taste of this in a previous lecture, but now we're going to go into it in more detail. And the way this fits into multiple linear regression is with the concept of the dummy variable. So here's the definition. So we have this variable xij. So what we're talking about is we're talking about the ith subject. So we're going to be using, even though this has a double subscript, we're going to be using single subscript for um, the responses. So here i is running from 1 to n, so the n total number of observations. And then j corresponds to a level of the factor. So here's the definition. So xij is equal to 1 if subject i out of n has the jth level of the factor and it's 0 otherwise. So if that's confusing, let's just look at let's just look at some examples. So here's what the model specification ends up being. So yi is b0 plus b1 xi1 plus b2 xi2 plus b3 xi3 plus epsilon i. So again, we're using single subscript notation for the response, but of course this is a covariate in multiple linear regression, so it's going to have uh, two subscripts. So again, let's just look at the example. So y2 is the second observation. Remember that this subject got the placebo, so level 1 of the factor. So this is going to be b0 plus b1 times x21. So x21 is 1 if subject 2 got level 1 of the factor, and it did. So subject 2 comes from the placebo group, which is level 1, so we get a 1 here. Then it's plus b2 times xi2, so here is uh, x22. x22 is 1 if subject 2 has level 2, and 0 otherwise. Now subject 2 does not have level 2, therefore this uh, uh, x22 is 0, so you get a 0 here. And then likewise, uh, x23 is also going to be 0 because subject uh, 2 did not get level 3 of the factor. So if you um, multiply these zeros through and simplify, you're going to get b0 plus b1 plus epsilon 2. So this is the formula. Now let's do number 8. So remember the 8th subject got the uh, drug A, so level 2 of the factor. So it did not get level 1, so you get a 0. It did get level 2, so you get a 1 for x82. And it did not get level 3, so you get a 0 for x83. So this becomes b0 plus b2 plus epsilon 8. And then the 11th subject um, got drug B, which is the third level of the factor, so you're going to get a 0 here, a 0 here, but a 1 for the dummy variable for the third level of the factor. And so this becomes, um, well, I have a typo here. This should be b0 plus b3 plus epsilon 11. So I'll fix that typo. b0 plus b3 plus epsilon 11. Now the general model, so this is, this is an example where we have a factor with three levels. In general, 
uh, we're going to have J levels. Um, and this is the general um, dummy variable specification for the model with J levels of the factor. It's just B0 plus sum J equals 1 to capital J, BJ, XIJ plus epsilon I. And if you'll notice, this is exactly the um, specification for the multiple linear model, um, but I'm using J to indicate the number of uh, variables because that's specific to the factor. So this is a, you know, it's a bit messier to write this than to simply write, for example, uh, this model specification. So it's not the most convenient way to write the model, but it does demonstrate to us that the factor model, even though it looks a little bit weird when you first write it down, it does fit into our multiple linear model framework, which means we can all use all of the techniques uh, and estimation methods uh, that we developed for multiple linear models and apply them to these factor models. It's also important to understand that um, what R is doing, you know, quote, under the hood, is it's using dummy variables to estimate models with factors. Now there's a minor complexity with how um, model degrees of freedom is handled in factors. And this is going to have some downstream effects. So it's really important to understand this topic here. So remember that the concept of model degrees of freedom, we think of this as like the number of numbers you need to provide to specify the mean or expected value part of the model. In the factor model, uh, it says that each level of the factor gets its own expected value. So if there are J levels of the factor, then without thinking about you know, how it's parameterized with the B0s and the BJs, forget about that for a second. The model just says that each level gets its own expected value. So if there are J levels, there must be J model degrees of freedom. Because we need to specify the mean part of the model, you just need to give me those capital J numbers. So with the drug trial, there were three levels. And so there are, each level gets its own expected value. So if I were to ask you, what are the means for this model, you would need to give me three numbers. So there must be three model degrees of freedom. Now the, the complexity, the little wrinkle here, is that when you specify the model, it has J plus one parameters. So if you were to just count them up, so in the drug trial, it's gonna be B0 plus B1 plus B2 plus B3, which is four parameters. In general, there's gonna be J levels. So you have B1 through B2 capital J, so that's J parameters, plus the B0, which makes J plus 1. So here's a case where there are more parameters than model degrees of freedom. And when that happens, we say that the model is over-parameterized, which just, just means exactly that. There's too many parameters. So in order to do anything with these models, we have to impose or apply a constraint to the mean parameters, the, the Bs, when we estimate them. Now this is very important. So this is gonna seem confusing at first, but there's an anchor that you can tie yourself to. And the anchor you tie yourself to is, first, the constraint doesn't change the model. So we're gonna look at a few different constraints. So remember that, we're not actually changing anything um, in the sense that B0 plus Bj is always going to be the expected value for level J. So this is your anchor if you get confused. B0 plus Bj is always the expected value for level J. What will change when we impose these constraints is that the interpretation of individual parameters may change. So here, this is different. This is not an individual parameter. So this is the sum of two parameters. So this interpretation never changes, but the interpretation of individual parameters such as B sub two will change. All right, now let's look at uh, one of them to make this a little bit more concrete. So the first one we're gonna start with is what R does by default. Um, this is called, uh, sometimes called the treatment constraint. And so what R does is it just sets B1 equal to zero. So this is the, 
the B parameter associated with the first level of the factor. Sometimes this is called the base level of the factor. Okay, so once you do this, so, um, well, first thing to think about is since there's just one extra parameter, so the model has J model degrees of freedom, and we have J plus one parameters, which means there's one extra parameter, we just have to specify one constraint. And this is the one constraint that R specifies by default. Now we're going to try to come up with interpretations for all the other parameters. Um, obviously, you don't have an interpretation for B1 because this was just kind of arbitrarily set to zero, but the other parameters will have interpretations. So our strategy for finding interpretations for the other parameters is to look at um, individual expected values, and we're going to look at combinations of expected values. Uh, most commonly, we'll look at differences in expected values. So let's, and, and the goal here is we're going to try to isolate individual parameters. And then once we've isolated an individual parameter, we go back and we see how did we isolate the parameter, and that's going to be the interpretation. So the, the, let's start with a simple one. So if we write down the expected value for level one, remember, let's return to our anchor. This is B0 plus B1. So that's all I'm writing here. And then I'm going to color code this. If I put a equal sign in red, that means I'm applying the specific constraint. So if I take B0 plus B1 and I apply the constraint that B1 equals 0, I get B0. So what this means is I can interpret B0 as the expected value for level 1 or the base level um, under the default R constraint that B1 equals 0. Okay, let's make this slightly more complicated. So that's B0. Now we've got to get interpretations for B2, B3 up to B capital J. So let's just look at um, B2. How do we isolate it? So the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to look at the expected value for level 2 minus the expected value for level 1. So these things, we know what these are by our anchor, B0 plus Pj. So expected value for level 2 is B0 plus B2 minus expected value for level 1, which is B0 plus B1. And before I apply the constraint, I already see a cancellation. The B0 will cancel, so this becomes B2 minus B1. And then red equal sign means I apply the constraint, so that B1 equals 0 and I get B2. So I've successfully isolated B2, and therefore I have to look back and see how I did that, and then that's my interpretation of B2. So the interpretation of B2 under the, this default R constraint is the expected value for level 2 minus the expected value for level 1. Um, sometimes we'll refer to this as this is the change in expected value when you move from level 1 to level 2. Okay, now in general for the lowercase j level, um, the way we isolate B sub j is expected value level j minus expected value level 1. So we're always going to be subtracting off level 1. This is B0 plus Bj minus B0 plus B1. The B0s cancel, you get B sub j minus B1. And applying the constraint, we get B sub j. So this means we can interpret B sub j as the difference between the expected value in level j and the expected value for level 1. Okay, so that's how it works um, by default in R. Uh, but of course there's other constraints you can use. So I'm going to go through a few of them. So in R it's also possible to um, use, I don't know if there's really a name for this, but I'm calling this the intercept constraint. So the constraint you could impose is um, not that B1 equals 0, but that B0 equals 0. So this is one constraint. And then here it's actually pretty easy to come up with interpretations for the, the other parameters, B1 up to B capital J. If you just look at the expected value for level J, um, this is our anchor. This is B0 plus Bj. Apply the constraint that B0 equals 0, and you get Bj. So here it's really easy to figure out how to isolate um, the individual parameters 
Um, so B sub J under this constraint is simply the expected value for level J. So you notice that, you know, nothing has changed in the model. The expected value is still B0 plus BJ. But here, under this constraint, B sub 2 is simply the expected value for level 2, whereas here, B sub 2 is the difference in the expected values between level 2 and level 1. So that's really important to, to remember. Um, so R will do this constraint by default. If you want to apply the intercept constraint in R, it's basically you do the same model specification, and we'll see this in the next video. Uh, but then you put a minus 1, and that will take out the intercept. All right, now um, SAS, which is another a, a different uh, statistical software program, it uses a different constraint. Uh, instead of setting the first level equal to 0, it sets the last level parameter equal to 0. And so the interpretation of the B sub J parameters, to isolate them, you have to do expected value for level lowercase j, so you know, just think level 2, minus the expected value for the last level, that will isolate uh, the B sub J parameter. So in SAS, the way you interpret uh, B sub 2 would be the difference between the expected value for the second level and the expected value for the last level. Uh, there's another software program called Jump. This is kind of an offshoot of SAS. Jump uses a different constraint, which is a little bit more complicated. Uh, this is sometimes called the sum to zero constraint. Uh, so what they do is they take B1 up to B capital J, and they set that quantity, take the sum of those, and set that quantity equal to zero. So that even though this involves multiple parameters, whereas the, all the other ones just involve one parameter, it's just a single equation. So we think of this as one constraint. Um, so the figuring out the interpretation of the parameters here is a little bit more complicated, uh, but people have figured this out, so I'll show you how this works. If you look at the average of all capital J expected values, well, the, the lowercase jth one is B0 plus Bj, so to get the average, you sum them up over lowercase j, and you divide by capital J. So this is the average of all the expected values. Um, now I can separate this. This is 1 over capital J uh, sum B0 plus 1 over capital J uh, sum Bj. And then the, the reason this is convenient is because here I'm now going to apply the constraint that this sum is 0, which means that this is 0, which leaves you with just this term. And this term is sum j equals 1 to capital J of just the same number. So this is capital J times b0. So it becomes this. And then you have the 1 over j out front. And therefore, this is just b sub 0. So this was a bit of algebra, um, but the result is that by applying this constraint to this quantity, we've isolated B sub 0, and therefore we can interpret B sub 0 as the average of all the expected values for the levels that appear in our data set. And then to get the interpretation of the uh, lowercase jth parameter, B sub j, we look at the level for expected value for love sorry the expected value for level j minus the average of all the expected values which is this is expected value for level j this is our anchor this is this average and if we apply this constraint we already figured out that this quantity is equal to b sub 0 when we apply the constraint so this just becomes b0 plus bj minus b0 which is b sub j so this is how you would isolate the B sub J parameter, and therefore it has this interpretation. It's the expected value for level J minus the average of all the expected values over all the levels in the data set. Okay, so this is all a bit confusing, and I, I sympathize with you that uh, there's all these different software programs, and they all do different things. Um, why didn't we all just get together and decide um, to agree on one constraint. Um, well, I wish we had, but we didn't. So I'm not going to I'm not going to protect you 
from this complexity because you're going to run into this in real life. If you um, go into a new research position or a new job where they use SAS in their lab or they use JUMP in, your, in their lab, you're going to have to know that JUMP applies this sum to zero constraint and therefore when you run regressions in JUMP and get parameter estimates, you have to interpret them differently. So this is really important to be aware uh, that this goes on when you use factor models. And this is going to go on not just for the simple one-factor model that we're going to be looking at. Um, it's going to happen for all models that involve factors. So we're going to be looking at more complicated uh, versions of factor models, and we're going to have to deal with things like this throughout the course. So if this seems confusing or hard to grasp or you don't understand why this happens, uh, you really need to pay close attention to this because one of the worst things you can do in an analysis is to interpret a model coefficient poorly. So you could do all this a great experiment and you could analyze the data, but at the end of the day, if you write up the paper and you say a parameter means something that it doesn't actually mean, then um, you know you're, that's a huge mistake. You can come to a completely wrong uh, conclusion based on your data. Okay, uh, the last page here is about testing. So like I said, uh, this factor model fits into the multiple linear model framework, um, and we saw that by looking at the dummy variable specification of the model, which means we can do all the things that we do uh, for multiple linear models with regards to testing. So here's an example. We have a hypothesis that uh, neither drug has an effect on blood pressure. So remember the experiment had a control group, a drug A group, and a drug B group. And the hypothesis here is that neither drug has an effect on blood pressure. Another way of saying this that's going to con be convenient for specifying a hypothesis is that the expected values for all three levels, control, drug A, and drug B, is the same. So in terms of our model parameters, how would you specify that hypothesis? Well, it's the following. Expected value for level 1 is B0 plus B1. That's equal to expected value for level 2, B0 plus B2, which is equal to the expected value for level 3, B0 plus B3. So this hypothesis in words corresponds to this hypothesis in terms of parameters. And you can see that this these equalities don't actually depend on the value of B0 because B0 appears in each quantity. Um, so you, this is equivalent to uh, this hypothesis, B1 equals B2 equals B3. So as long as this is true, then this will be true as well. Okay, so if you want to test this hypothesis, since this involves two equal signs, we can't uh, use a t-test, we need an f-test. And remember the procedure for the f-test is we have to write down the full model and the reduced model. So the full model is just our factor model. So in single subscript notation, it's this. In the reduced model, we get that by applying the null hypothesis to the full model. So if we apply this hypothesis to the full model, basically we're saying that b2 equals b1, and B3 equals B1. So we can just write this as B0 plus B1 plus epsilon i. So all three levels have this expected value, B0 plus B1. Um, and if you stare at this, you can see that, you know, this is just a model, um, the, you know, constant mean model, but it has two parameters. Uh, so this is actually over-parameterized. So you can simplify this to just yi equals b0 plus epsilon i, and then you interpret b0 as the um, this common expected value among the three levels. So this is the this is a kind of the simplest way to write the reduced model, and this is the full model. So the next thing we have to do is fit the two models. We have to um, store the residual sum of squares, and the and then we have to figure out what the model degrees of freedom are. So let's just say we fit the model and we got um, RSS0, the re, uh, residual sum of squares from the reduced model. RSS1, residual sum of squares from the full model. And then we have to think about what are the um, model degrees of freedom. So recall that uh, the model degrees of freedom for the uh, one-factor model is the number of levels of the factor, which is three in this experiment. 
And then the reduced model degrees of freedom is the model degrees of freedom for the reduced model. So this is just one because you just need to specify one number to get the expected value um, part of the model for the reduced models, just B0. So that's one. So the F statistic is going to look uh, something like this. RSS0 minus RSS1 divided by 3 minus 1, which is 2. So the difference in model complexity is 2. And then you have RSS1 over residual degrees of freedom from the full model. Okay, so the F test works exactly the same. You just have to be careful about um, getting the uh, model degrees of freedom for these models correct. And this is slightly more complicated for the factor model because of the overparameterization. Okay, so something to discuss uh, when we meet for office hour. Uh, suppose we had a different hypothesis. And the hypothesis was that the drugs do have an effect, but there's no difference in the size of the effect for drugs uh, A and B. So the hypothesis, the two drugs have the same effect. Um, so in this case, what is the null hypothesis in terms of the parameters? How would you write down the reduced model? And can you do this with a t-test? So you can always use an f-test for these kinds of hypotheses, but um, you could not use an a t-test for this one. Question is, can you do a t-test for this one, and how would that how would that work?